Hi everyone and welcome to Perfect Exposure and Perfect Color in Landscape Photography and sponsored by Sekonic today. So thanks to Sekonic for making this possible. I'm Joe Brady. I'm going to be your host and your tour guide today as we take what we've learned in our last session and put it to use in a field trip to Death Valley National Park. Now if you missed the last session, you can view it on the Sekonic website, but I will review where appropriate so that everything that we talk about today still makes sense. So let's first reintroduce two tools that every photographer should have. One, a light meter. I'm going to be using two different Sekonic meters. They're going to give us perfect exposure information. Next, I've got a color checker passport here from X-Rite, and this in addition has the Sekonic gray card in here. I've talked about both of these before, but never together. Uh, so there's a big reason to do so, but we're going to review the, some of the gear first. First of all, why a light meter? Well, as I mentioned, I'm using two different meters. I've got the Sekonic 478DR right here, and I have the Sekonic 758DR here as well. The beauty of a light meter is that they give you incident readings. They measure the light falling on the scene. Unlike your camera's internal meter, they're not influenced by the color or the contrast in the scene. Now, the way your camera's meter works is when it looks at the entire scene, it averages it out to a middle gray. In this case, really something like this. It's taking all the data it's seeing and it's picking middle gray, meaning this, based on what it's seeing. It's taking all the different light patterns and doing that. The problem is, what do you do if you've got either a low key, a dark scene, or an overly bright scene? Or the same with clothing. Here I am wearing a white shirt. If a photograph was taken of me that had, a, like, say, a vertical portrait that had a lot of this shirt in, and you relied on the camera's meter, chances are it's going to underexpose because it's going to take everything it sees and averages it to that middle gray. Conversely, if I was wearing a black suit, it would do just the opposite. And you've probably seen this if you've ever photographed weddings, where a black suit causes the camera's meter to overexpose. It still wants to go to this middle gray. So it's going to make everything that's white overexpose. The beauty of a meter, like one of these, is they're not influenced by color or the contrast in the scene. They're simply measuring the light that is falling on the subject so they don't get fooled by the color of what they're wearing. Now the passport. <clears throat> so why do you want to have a passport? <clears throat> to me this is one of the, the best investments you can make. The color checker passport gives you the tools so that you can get consistent and accurate color under practically any light source. It also gives a color standard. Cameras not only have different ideas as to what that middle gray is, but they also have different ideas as to what standard colors are. There is no real standard for, say, red. What this does is gives you that color standard and also gives us a couple of different tools to do custom white balance as a reference. So together, they're even better than the sum of their parts because now they can work together. What this combination allows you to do is calibrate the meter to the camera. And this is done through Sekonic's free DTS software. You can find it on their site. What it allows you to do is to create an exposure profile for your camera. That means the meter learns what your camera thinks middle gray is, and it also learns the entire dynamic range of your camera's sensor. You can do this wherever. You can do it even on location, which is what we did here. So let's take our first little trip out to Death Valley and do a uh, camera exposure calibration for the meter. So let's go ahead and do a little field test uh, for calibrating the meter to the card. Now I've got the Sekonic 478DR here, and I'm going to do kind of an intermediate ISO. At 400 ISO, uh, my shutter speed is 50th of a second, and the first thing I want to do is I want to measure the, the light falling on the card, so that's going to be my incident reading. Then I'm going to put on the optional spot attachment and to take a reading with that. So we're going to do an incident reflective reading off of the color checker. I've got my meter here, so I'm going to just come in and take my reading. And I want to make sure I'm in full shade. It's fairly bright in here. Uh, I just don't want any sun actually landing on this. And I'm going to adjust my shutter speed so that I come in at around f8. Let's see. OK, so there we go. I'm at 40th of a second, ISO 400. And I don't know if you can see it through here, but I've got 8 and 1 tenth. So the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take off the dome. I'm just going to put it aside here. And I'm going to put on the spot attachment, which is right here. And it just goes over top. So let me go ahead and take my spot reading off of the ref gray target here. And I get 7 and 2 tenths. 
So my ambient incident reading was eight and one tenth. My spot meter reading attachment told me seven and two tenths. So when we calibrate, that'll straighten those two out. That's almost a third of a stop off. Not really unusual to happen. Now that said, if you don't have the spot attachment, what you will do when you go into the software is you'll simply use the reading that you got from your incident reading in both spots. So I'll take another reading to see if I got any changes here. And I'm still exactly at eight and one tenth. So eight and one tenth, seven and two tenths for the spot meter reading attachment. Those will go in the software first. The next step is to take our shots of the actual color checker target, one with our incident reading, which again will be a F8, 40th of a second at 400 ISO. And then we'll open up three stops and close down three stops. That'll give us all the data we need to create an exposure profile to put into the meter. And by the way, even though I'm using a 478 DR here, uh, I also have a 758 with me. I can do that same test with that meter. I'll use the same exposures for the shot. The only thing with the 758 is I'll also do the incident and the spot reading and see what the differences are for those. So again, eight and, eight and one tenth, seven and two tenths for my spot meter reading. Let's get the exposure shots. All right, so I'm gonna do my first set of exposures with the mirrorless camera that I brought with me. This is a Sony NEX6. And I have a 70 or an 18 to 200 lens on here that does not go down to 2.8. And typically, if I'm shooting a DSLR, I will meter this so that I have f8 at my middle reading. So I'll adjust my ISO and shutter speed to get f8, and then go down to 2.8 to open up three stops, and then up to f22 to close down three stops. I can't do that with this lens. It doesn't have that range. I won't go down to 2.8. So the other way I can do it is just by simply adjusting the shutter speed to get my three exposures. So again, let me get my reading. Again, I'm at 400 ISO. I'm just gonna come and get a meter reading in front of the target, and I've got F7. So let me go ahead and I'm gonna adjust so I get F8. Okay, so at a 50th of a second, I get F8, 400 ISO. Perfect. So I'm gonna put my camera on F8, and I'm gonna do my three shots. So 50th of a second is gonna be my middle. To open up two stops or three stops from there, I need to go from 50 to 25th would be one stop, 12 would be two stops, sixth of a second would be three stops. Going the other direction, 100 would be one stop, 200 would be two stops, 400th of a second would be three stops. So those will be my three shots to create the exposure profile using this particular camera. Okay, so 50th of a second at 400 ISO is gonna be my exact middle shot. So, okay, that looks good. Now I'm gonna open up three stops, just using shutter speed. So 25 is one, actually 13th of a second is two, and then down to sixth of a second will be three. So this will be three stops overexposed, and I look on it and yes it is. So now I'm gonna go the other direction, staying on F8 the entire time. And now I'm gonna go up from Again, 50 to 100 is one stop, to 200 is two stops, to 1 400th of a second is three stops closed. Take my shot, and lovely. So that's my three exposures, one right on, one three stops open, one three stops closed. Now I have all the data I need to create that exposure profile to then put into the meter. Okay, so I see we've already started a whole bunch of questions, so, but they're really good ones, so let's, uh, let's get to that right away. First of all, good question. Someone asked, if you're using an incident meter outdoors and it's sunny, should the dome be up or down? Good question. Generally, the dome for landscape photography is going to be up. Uh, the reason to do a dome down is when you really need to measure a light that is very directional. Now, there might be a time when you're doing a portrait outside where you would want that directional reading, like if somebody was in shadow here and bright light was hitting their face here. But generally for landscape photography, I'm going to take my reading like this. I'm going to hold the meter out flat and take my reading because the dome is then going to mirror 3D objects. So if the sun is over here and it's coming down at this direction, it'll be bright on one side, but the other side will be in shade, and that's going to give me a good middle gray or a good middle reading for that average. But that, that's a really good question, and we're going to address that also in some of the future videos. This is a really good question also. Someone asked, what is the benefit of using the color checker passport if you're going to artistically adjust white balance in post-process anyway? Good point, and we're going to address that when we go into Lightroom a little bit. But what it does do is it puts your raw file 
in the absolute best place it can be at the start. And you're going to get the balance of colors correct. What you're going to see is when we apply the profile, in particular, the blue skies get a little more depth to them. They kind of pop into place. So yes, I do a lot of artistic adjustments for my landscapes, uh, and, and a lot of it is subjective. But by having the color profile for it, then you're getting the best possible starting point. And we're, we're going to address that a little bit later. Uh, some, <laughs> someone asked, why does the passport have an expiration date? Good question. Uh, I didn't even know mine does. Actually, I have the new one with the kind of gray card, and there's nowhere to put an expiration date on it. Uh, passports will last a good long time. Yes, they'd like you to buy one every three months, if possible. Don't spill coffee on it. Don't leave it open on the dashboard of your car on a sunny summer day. Other than that, though, these have hard plastic covers, and they are pretty light tight. So if you keep them sealed and you keep them in the camera bag, uh, I, you pretty safely bet they're going to last beyond that expiration date. Uh, someone also asks, which chip on the standard passport is 18% gray? Well, there's one that's really close. It's not quite 18%, but it's the fourth one in. Um, don't get too hung up on the 18% gray thing. I know we've all been taught over the years that 18% gray is what middle gray is on all these cameras. Turns out it's not the case. It's actually, and it varies from manufacturer to manufacturer again, uh, middle gray on most cameras is somewhere between 12.5% and 14% gray. And we were all brought up with 18%, which goes back to the film days. So don't get too hung up on that. But the, the profile that you create, the exposure profile that you create with this, will find out what the camera's middle gray is and then put that into the meter. Yeah, that's something we've all been dealing with for many years, 18%, when it's really not real anymore. Okay, um, someone asked about if you use the Passport to create profiles using Lightroom, uh, don't you need to keep the profile generated for each scene you use it for? And what happens if the profile is lost or deleted? Or if you transfer to another uh, Lightroom installation, do those profiles transfer? For, they will stay on the same computer. If you reinstall Lightroom or put another version of Lightroom, or Photoshop for that matter, it will see it. It actually lives in an Adobe folder in your system. If you go to another computer, yes, you're going to have to transfer those profiles over. They don't actually get built into the, into the image file until you turn it into something else. Once you export it as a PSD or a TIFF or a JPEG, then that color data gets built into the file. But as a RAW, it's, it is referencing that profile. So if you delete the profile and haven't processed those images, then you're going to have to get that profile back or live without it. Uh, someone asked, am I going to show how to set up the dynamic range calibration? Actually, I think we just saw that. Uh, but if you need more questions about it, again, answer, ask in the chat room. Let's see. So someone asked, why do you need three exposures? Good question. What those three exposures are doing is they're figuring out where the clipping range is on your sensor up and down. So we've got our one perfect exposure in the middle. When we shoot that exposure that is three stops overexposed, these are going to start to clip. And where these colors clip is how the software finds out the upper limit of the sensor. Conversely, the other way, when the shadows clip, when we do that exposure that's three stops under, these patches really start to disappear. They end up having no data at all. The software looks at where does it finally start to see data on the dark exposure, where does it stop seeing data on the bright exposure, and from that, that's how it's able to figure out the actual tonal range of the sensor. It's actually a pretty clever way of doing it. Okay, let's see. Uh, someone asked, is the color checker passport just for Lightroom? They, I use Capture One. In order, well, the, certainly the profiles that we're doing, the exposure profiles that are going into the meter, uh, are software independent. They don't really care. They are telling the meter what the camera's capabilities are, where middle gray is, and what is the camera's tonal range. If you're talking about a, a color profile uh, for your camera, then that has to be, unfortunately at this point, it has to be in one of the Adobe suite. Uh, it works on a DNG system rather than ICC, which is Adobe's way of doing things behind the scenes. They've been trying to get everybody to adapt it. But right now, uh, Aperture, uh, Phase 1's Capture One, uh, Capture NX, all those other softwares uh, do not follow the DNG protocol. So right now, only Lightroom, Photoshop, and other programs that use Adobe Camera Raw, like Photoshop Elements, can take advantage of the color profiles that the Passport creates. Let's see. So where does the profile go? Well, okay. 
two or two different profiles. Again, we've got the exposure profile and the camera color profile. The exposure profile gets stored in the computer and then actually transferred into the meter through the meter's uh, USB port and the DTS software. The, ex the color profile lives in a folder on your computer. It's actually in an Adobe folder. If you really need to know where they are, send me a note and I'll tell you where they are. But understand that knowing where they are, generally no good can come of that because if you move them or change the name, then uh, the software will stop seeing them. Okay, so, so another good question. Do you need a separate profile if you're outdoor for two to four hours and the lighting changes? Again, we're, here, we're talking about a color profile. The exposure profile is just what your camera's capabilities are. A color profile is going to change when the lighting spectrum changes, not when the white balance changes. So in this case, if you're out in the field for four hours and the sun is starting to get lower in the sky, the color temperature is going to change, but the spectrum of the sun is still the same. So you only really need to create one daylight profile. We're not going to do studio stuff today. This is about landscape. But in studio, I would do one for tungsten lights, one for my strobes, one for my speed lights, and when I encounter a mixed lighting situation. But for landscape photography, really all I need is one profile, well, maybe two. I'll do one for sunlight and one for shade uh, or cloudy days. But then I always will do a white balance. So I will always have a shot of this just as a reference so I can always get that white balance as a good starting point. And we'll talk more about that later as well. But wow, great questions. Keep them coming. I want to continue on for now. Uh, let me just talk a little more about those exposure profiles. As I mentioned before, every camera manufacturer has their own idea as to what constitutes that middle gray, meaning that perfect exposure in the middle. That means every brand is different as to what a perfect exposure is. An exposure profile does two things. One, it tells the meter what your camera thinks middle gray is. And it might seem a, a minor point, but what I recently discovered I, was, uh, I profiled my camera and my wife's camera. I shoot the Sony Alpha 99. Uh, my wife shoots a Canon 7D. And when I did exposure profiles for each of those cameras, I found out that they were actually in a, a half a stop apart as to what they all, each thought middle gray was. So if I used the same reading uh, for each camera, one of them would end up being slightly underexposed. So this tells it exactly what your camera thinks that middle gray is. Two, it tells the meter the tonal range of your camera sensor, and that's where those three exposures come in. It tells where the shadows and the highlights might be beyond your camera's capability to capture that part of the scene. Again, I learned a lot about the, uh, the Sony when I was creating my profile for it. I found out that I had eight stops of exposure uh, up and down, four up and down from my middle exposure, which was actually pretty amazing. So next part, what if you're out in the field and you're using filters? Maybe you're using a circular polarizer or a neutral density filter. Also, how do you protect your highlights? That's the one thing you, is the most important thing for landscape photography, is you've got to protect that highlight. If you've got some puffy white clouds, you do not want them to blow out, because there's nothing worse than a pure white, no data thing when you go to print it. Now, I frequently use a circular polarizer in my landscape photography. I'll also sometimes use an ND filter or a neutral density filter when I need to bring the exposure down. Typically the only time I need to do that is if I'm photographing moving water and I want to have that blur of the water. Then I'll put a neutral density filter on. How do you factor in the loss of light that these filters cause into your meter? Now the second question is, how do you expose your highlights as bright as possible, getting them right over to the right side of the histogram without clipping those brightest parts in the scene? So we're going to head out to the racetrack in Death Valley and see how it's done. In fact, here's some shots I took at the racetrack. Uh, if you've never been out to Death Valley, this is the place to go. One warning, this trip, I got three flat tires on this day. Uh, we thought we were going to end up sleeping on our car that night. We were saved by some nice folks with some fix -a flats uh, The racetrack is very remote. Even though they are maintained park roads, the gravel in there is, some, is extremely sharp. And even though we had a four-wheel drive vehicle, we lost three tires. But it's a very cool place. It's a dry lake bed. These stones, if you're not familiar with the place, uh, the mystery of this place is that these stones have kind of tumbled down from the surrounding mountains. And while no one's ever actually witnessed it, somehow some moisture or ice gets on the flat lake bed and the wind blows the stones around and they leave these tracks. 
uh, around the dry lake bed. It's a, it's a really mysterious and very cool place. So let's head out to the racetrack and see how to compensate for those filters. All right, so we've gone through the process of creating an exposure profile for the meter. Now we need to deal with some filter compensation. We're out here in the uh, really remote part of Death Valley. This is called the racetrack out here. This is where the, uh, the rocks kind of slide around and move on their own and no one has ever seemed to actually seen it happen. We've got beautiful bright blue skies and beautiful white clouds, so we're going to really want to use a polarizer. But if I take my reading, I need to figure out how much of an effect the polarizer is going to have on the reading. So if I just hold the meter out here, with this, and this is, by the way, how I'll do a landscape. I've got a directional sun kind of starting to set off to the west. I'll just hold it out flat so that the dome kind of mirrors me. And I see at 50th of a second, which I'm shooting, by the way, because I'm filming with the, the Sony Alpha 99, and the video speed we're using is a 50th of a second with 100 ISO. Uh, F16 is the answer we got. However, what effect does this have? Well, easy to find out. As I spin this around, I can see a darkening of the sky. Let's see what happens to the meter as I take a reading actually through the polarizer. And as I rotate it, so I got F10, as I rotate it around, there we go, F9, and that might be the strongest part. So it seems about F9. And since we had F16 and 2 tenths, basically we're looking at two stops. And we got F9 right there. So this is causing a two stop reduction in light. So we want to program that into the meter. It's really very simple on the 478. I can't show you the menus out here, but I'm going to do it right here. I just hit the menu button, go to filter compensation, put in 2 and OK. Now when I take a reading, that same reading I get right here, I'm getting F8. What's F8? Two stops different than F16. It's two stops open, and I need to open because of the filter. It's, that's it. All right, the next piece of the puzzle I want to check is these bright clouds here. Are they beyond the exposure range of the camera? Now again, we've created an exposure profile, we've put that into here, and we need to just activate it. And the easiest way to do that is, well, we'll take that middle reading, and again, remember, we're already compensating for uh, the circular polarizer, so I'm getting around F8, F9, in between there somewhere. So what I'm gonna do is hit the little uh, wrench button, and one of the options is mid-tone set. We're going to put that right in the middle, because that's what that was, a middle reading, and then tell it to select that from the reading we just took. Now what I'm going to do is remove the Lumisphere and, put, and replace it with the spot meter attachment, which I have right here. So now I've got a spot meter attachment, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to point this up at the brightest clouds and take some readings. So I'll just look around, look for the brightest spot, and then hit the other button on the other side, which is the uh, memory button. And as I continue to go around here, I can check to see, are any of these readings more than, oh, say, three stops off of my memory? And I can look through here, and I had F9 or F8 for my ambient incident reading here. When I'm looking at the clouds, I'm only getting F10, F11. Basically, what it's saying is it's a very flat tonal range. And I can see on the bottom of the scale, and we'll show you this better, I can see on the bottom of the scale with my mid-tone in green, I can go all the way up to, well, it's hard to see right here in the sun. Let me see. Let me turn around my glasses off. With 5, 6 in the middle, I can go up to F22 before I start to have some clipping based on the exposure profile I've created. So with my clouds at F11, not even a concern. So I can use my F9, F8 reading for my incident. Everything in the scene is going to fall in. But I don't have to guess. The meter is telling me right on the bottom of the screen. All right. So you guys are trying to stump me, but I've got some interesting questions that I know the answers to. So I'm going to get to those. And yes, if you're wondering, I am wearing my Death Valley hiking shirt. So I am keeping with the theme today. First of all, good question. Somebody asked, what is the angle of incidence on the spot meter? Can it be used to meter a small area on a distant object? Good question. Now, we've got two meters here again, as I mentioned. I've got the 478 and I've got the 758. On the 478, the spot meter is, a, is an extra attachment. And this is a five degree spot meter. Are you going to be able to meter uh, some kind of small distant object with this? 
My guess is no. Uh, it's it's going to be more useful for maintaining your highlights and, and finding the highlights in the sky. If you want to do that, uh, then you're going to need to go to the 758, which I have right here. The 758 has an integrated spot meter. I actually look through it and see this is a one degree spot meter. Uh, so yes, in this case, if that's the kind of thing you're after, the kind of precision you're after, the 758 can do that. So good question. So one degree versus five degrees is a lot when you're going after distant objects. Uh, someone, has, someone said they have a Canon camera and it has picture styles. Um, by shooting the passport, what style should I select in my camera? Technically, it doesn't matter. If you're shooting a raw file, once it gets into the software, it's going to ignore the style anyway once you apply a profile to it. But in general, I'd recommend against dealing with the picture styles. They're very subjective. Uh, the landscape one, for example, is very contrasty and overly saturated. If that's the look you like, that's fine. It's really designed, for, to me, it's really designed for JPEG shooters rather than RAW shooters. We're going to be dealing with RAW because, remember, you can only apply a custom color profile to a RAW file. And once you create that profile, uh, it's going to figure out where all the color should be based on the color checker. So it's going to completely override that style setting. So stick to the standard setting. In fact, what you might want to do is create your own standard. And when I was shooting the Canons, what I typically did was I created a standard uh, picture setting in my camera that was for video. Uh, what it did was it decreased the contrast and decreased the saturation a little bit. And in an attempt, and I don't know how successful I was, in an attempt to actually squeeze out a little more tonal range out of the camera by lowering that contrast setting. However, again, we're dealing with a raw file. Once I create a profile with the passport, it's going to ignore any style or settings that you had. Uh, someone asked, should we profile each lens used on the camera? Theoretically, Different lenses, because of their coatings, are going to have a little bit different effect on color because the coatings might absorb light differently. Me personally, I haven't come across any of my lenses that had enough of a change that I could see. I have heard of people that have, that have tried that. So what I'd recommend is, if you've got two lenses that are kind of extreme, extremely apart, maybe an ultra-wide and an ultra-long, try a profile for each of them under the same lighting conditions and see if you get a different result. You can certainly do that. And in fact, in Lightroom, it's very easy to segregate your images by any data you want, by camera model number, by even camera serial number, and by lens that was shot. So if you wanted to apply a profile to a specific lens, you could do that. Uh, someone asked about how do you meter backlit landscapes with a handheld meter? I'm not sure exactly what you mean by a backlit landscape. Um, but if you're talking about something where the sun is actually in the scene or almost in the scene, then you're definitely going to hit a contrast range that's going to be way beyond what your camera can handle. You're going to enter HDR land at that point. Uh, and at that point, I would take shadow and highlight readings, really a subject for another day. But I'd be curious to, to hear an expansion on that question, exactly what you mean by backlit. And when we are done, I will get, we will give you an email address that you can send questions to, and I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's another one. Since there is a slight difference in light transmissivity, I think I said that right, uh, of the atmosphere as the altitude changes, do you need to recalibrate if something done sea level versus, say, you're shooting at 10,000 feet? And again, depends on how precise you want to be. Uh, but the answer is yes, there actually is a color spectrum change that's going to happen as you go up higher in altitude. It's kind of analogous to shooting out in the desert southwest versus, say, shooting in Miami, and I actually did this test a couple of years ago, so I actually know what happens here. What's really happening is you're getting a change of um, water vapor in the atmosphere. And the less you get, the redder the atmosphere gets. Because if any of you have ever tried to take pictures underwater, you know as soon as you start to go underwater three feet, you start to lose a lot of red. The water in the atmosphere absorbs the red. That's why if you're an east coaster and you go out to the desert southwest, on a bright sunny day and the sky just looks unnaturally blue because we're not used to seeing that. That's what's going on there. There's a bigger red component in that very dry atmosphere. The same thing ends up happening as you go up to a higher altitude. You're getting less atmosphere, there's less moisture in it, there's less absorption of the light, so you're getting a stronger red component, so the blue is going to get even more intense. Do you need to create a profile for those differences? Again, it's a subjective thing. I have tried it. Yes, there is a little bit of a difference. You can see a slight difference. I do have a 
daylight profile for the desert southwest versus my east coast ones. It's minor, but it doesn't hurt to, to try that. But it's, it's a good question, and it's an interesting thing. And the, reason, the way I found this out, by the way, when I was doing this test, uh, my wife works on the Mars rover project for NASA, and I actually had her ask some of her atmospheric science buddies if this was correct, and they said that's exactly what goes on because they were dealing with that, trying to take pictures on Mars. Uh, someone else asks, what are the two color panels on the passport? And again, this is subject for another day. Uh, if you're really interested in the passport and the details, uh, I've done a handful of webinars for x -Rite. They live on xrightphoto.com. When we do our follow-up email, we'll let you know where they are, and I, I give a complete demo on what the passport does. This one is really designed, I would say, a little bit more for portraits than landscape. Uh, these are different color patches for adding kind of selective warming and cooling. Uh, I do find that these bottom patches, uh, which are designed for landscapes, can add a little coolness back into a scene. So if your tree's got a little bit too much red in the leaves, uh, and the sky has lost a little bit of its blue. If you white balance with a patch that is very slightly pink, very slightly magenta, it puts more oomph back into the greens and blues. Uh, and the nice thing about having these patches is you can get there all the time. Again, a subject for another day, but webinars already exist. We'll send you the link for that if you're interested. Uh, another question, somebody asked, what papers and printers did I use for the prints behind me? Uh, thank you for asking. Um, I use a Canon 6350, that's what I have in my studio, and that's what these were printed on. These were printed on the Ilford Fine Art textured paper and then mounted to Cintra board. Uh, it is really, it's a gorgeous paper. We've got lights shining on it. As you can see, there's no glare. Um, I just, I also did a webinar on, on these papers not too long ago, so uh, we'll include that link from the Ilford webinar as well. And lastly, Somebody asked, what is the impact of ISO changes on the color profiles? Not too much. Uh, I've done it until you get to extremes, until you get above 3200 ISO. I haven't seen too much of a color shift. And again, it's going to change on your individual camera. What I have seen, though, is the exposure profiles change when you get up to the extreme ISOs. You start to lose some, uh, to some range latitude on the high ISOs, so you might want to have a profile uh, an exposure profile in your meter for a very high ISO versus a mid-range. So I would say do one at maybe 400 ISO and then another one at 3200 ISO and see what happens in your camera if you're getting a different exposure range. All right, so I see there's more questions coming through, but I want to continue on. I want to show you just more closely, uh, we, after we've created that camera exposure profile and how to compensate for filters, I just want to show you more closely where it is on the meters because that is something that drives people nuts. So let me actually show you the meters here. Let me get Rick to come in close here. So here we've got the meter. And it's very simple on the 478DR. I just hit the menu button. It's actually called exposure compensation. Actually, before I do that, let me actually take a reading of our studio lights. You can see I'm at 1600 ISO at 125th of a second. I'll hold it out flat, take my reading, and you can see I've got, whoops, let me change it so you can actually see. I've got F8, so I hit the menu, exposure compensation, and over here I will put two, because I, I know that I lost two stops from my circular polarizer, I wanna add that back. So hit OK, hit the menu button, and look, the reading automatically changes from F8 to F4, which is two stops open from F8. So there we go, so there's how you do it in the 478. On the 758, it's a little bit more hidden, but in some ways, after you do it, it's easier to get into and out of. Because, actually, let me go back to the 478. If I go back to here, that exposure compensation is on all the time. If I want to get rid of it, I have to go back into here and change this back to zero, and then cancel it out, and then it will put it back. On the 478, or the 758, rather, I can access it whenever I like. But what you have to do is go into the custom functions. So I'll turn the meter off. I have to hold in the mode button and hit the power button. And it comes up with this 010. Now these are the custom functions and there's no way you can remember all these. However, either in the manual or on the little paper that comes with the meter, you might, this is a list of all the custom functions for the 758. 
I don't know if you can see it on the video or not, but number one says ISO2. So what is the ISO2 button going to do? Above that it says zero is ISO and one says F comp or filter compensation. So what I want is custom function one to be one which will turn the ISO2 button into a compensation button. So I'll put this back on and I'm in custom function one to cycle through the choices I just simply hit the mode button and you can see it cycles back 0, 1, 0, 1 and I want it to be number one. So then I turn off the power and turn it back on and now what's happened is the ISO2 button is now a filter compensation. So if you look over in the upper right hand corner here, if I hold in ISO2, you can see it says 3.0 there. So if I know my filter needs uh, two stops, I can spin the dial, the jog wheel here, until we see 2.0. So that means that will change the exposure by two stops. So now I can go ahead just like I did before. I'll take a reading uh, with my meter. I hope I put it into spot metering. Take a reader with take a yeah, take a reading with my meter. Say that three times fast. And you can see once again I got F8 hundredth of a second. I'm at 1600 ISO. If I wanted to know what two stops open from that was because of my polarizer, just hold in the ISO2 button for a second and you can see it changes to four just like we did on the 478. Now what's really cool is what if what if you are doing this and you've got both a circular polarizer and you're trying to meter spot meter for that bright cloud. Now I know my camera can safely capture up and down three stops from that middle gray. So if I'm going to take a spot meter reading off of that brightest cloud, I know I want to open up three stops from that because that'll put that bright white right to the edge of my histogram. I'm also using a polarizer which is subtracting two stops. So that means I've got a five stop difference. Going back and forth on that on some meters is very complicated. On the 758 it's very easy so let me, let's take a look close again here. So as I zoom in if I hold in the ISO 2 button I can spin the jog wheel all the way up to five. Let me go all the way up to five here and now I can take my reading and I'm still at F8 but trying to figure out what five stops open from that is can be a little difficult to remember at the top of your head. So if I hold in the ISO 2 button you can see it goes from F8 to F1.4. Well what if I don't have a lens that goes to 1.4? So what I can do is hold that in and I can adjust, I can, ch I can change my mode and I can also adjust the shutter speed accordingly and I can see there I'm going to let's say I'll go up to F18 hold in ISO 2 and I can see now I'm at 3.2 at 1 20th of a second so you can pick the best aperture and shutter speed based on what your needs are uh, I do find myself actually using this function a lot I will frequently use a combination of a circular polarizer plus I will use the spot meter function on the 758 to capture my brightest white cloud I'll put that three stops open compensate two stops for my polarizer and that gives me the perfect exposure to be able to capture the brightest little white piece in these clouds put it right to the right but just close enough where it's not going to clip I'm going to have enough data so it's really handy and it assures me that I get the best exposure possible it's a good idea to have your data as far over to the right as possible because that's where most of your data in your digital capture lives so Let's go back out in the field. We're going to put the meter to use now. We're going to go out and do a sunrise shoot and again we're going to see holding the meter out horizontally parallel to the ground with the dome up to get that sunrise exposure again because the sun's coming in like this. I do have the dark opposite side of the dome and it's going to give me a good middle gray for a scene that can get fairly contrasty. Let's go back to Death Valley. Ah, it's a bit breezy out here but just getting ready for sunrise. We're at Zabriskie Point, which is right over there. And uh, we've got our meters all calibrated. Gonna get our exposure. I'm gonna take a flat reading using the meter with the dome out so it mirrors what we're seeing out there. And uh, let's give it a shot. And it's getting a little chilly, but it's supposed to be 99 today, so it should be warm before too long. So in this particular spot, uh, I wanna have a lot of depth of field because there's uh, 
canyon right in front of me, and then we have the distant mountains. So I'm going to go like F14, F16. So if I just put F16 in here, I also want to do very low noise, so I'm at 100 ISO. So I'm just going to hold out the meter like this, so again, so it mirrors kind of how the light's coming into the meter. And if you can see how well you can see that, there's my meter. It's showing me two seconds uh, is going to be my exposure. So I have my camera on uh, timer, and I'm going to set it for two seconds at F16 at 100 ISO. Let's take a look. All right, so I've taken my calibration and I've loaded it into the meter for my Alpha 99. Now, I'm here at uh, Zabriskie Point in Death Valley, uh, which is off back in that way. And you can see we're just after sunrise, so there's a lot of deep shadows and there's some bright uh, light on some of the peaks. So the camera meter really has a, tr has a lot of trouble trying to give you a correct exposure for this. So all I have to do is uh, put my ISO, I'm at 100 ISO. I wanted a lot of depth of field, so I'm shooting at F20. So in this case, since the sun is very low, I'm actually want to measure the light coming in this way. And I just hit the read button and I get uh, 1 20th of a second at F20 at 100 ISO. I'm going to go ahead and put that in my camera, take the shot, and it's going to be perfect exposure. Now there is a little bit of subjectivity. Uh, if you've got some very deep shadows that you might want to open a little bit, you can do that. I can tell from this scene, however, that there are no really bright highlights. There's no clouds. There's no whites that I have to protect. So I can open up a little bit if I want to give myself a little bit more room for post-processing and kind of push this file to the right. But my middle reading, uh, as far as the meter is concerned, coming in here is going to be 1 20th of a second at uh, F20 at 100 ISO. So let's give that a try. Okay, couple, just a couple questions before we continue on. Uh, someone asked, I, I, maybe I did say this, uh, maybe I misspoke. Um, I seem to be, if I seem to be interchanging RAW and JPEG files interchangeably, they're not interchangeable. I am strictly a RAW shooter. However, what I do do is I shoot RAW files of those three exposures and then export JPEGs to use in the DTS software. Uh, that's the only time I go into JPEG or if they're going to go on my website. Other than that, they stay in RAW until they're going out to a lab. Uh, here's a really good point. Somebody, somebody mentions, it, it said they, it seems it might be easier to use the in-camera meter and histogram to verify you have a proper exposure. What's the advantage of using the external incident meter? Good question. First of all, a lot of people, and, and I've done it in the past myself, have trouble trusting or really reading what a histogram is telling you on the back of the camera. The histogram is a reflection of the distribution of light and dark in the scene in front of you. Now, if it's a bright, sunny day, puffy white clouds, clear sun, middle of the afternoon, yes, you can work that way. It's going to work fine. Where you're going to get into trouble is when you've got objects or pieces of the scene in front of you that are either very dark or very light. Case in point. Uh, I was shooting in an engagement session with a couple who went in a rowboat out on a dark lake with a dark pine tree forest behind them. Beautiful, bright, sunny day. However, because of the dark lake and the dark pine trees, the histogram was way to the left. And even I questioned, I was using a meter, and I questioned, wow, is there something wrong with my meter? Because when I put that number in, the histogram looked really kind of screwy. So. I had a moment of weakness, and I said, you know what, let me just use the camera's histogram. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just not thinking straightly here. And I went to adjust it and made the histogram look kind of in the middle, and I said, oh, that's good, nothing's clipping. But she was wearing, a, actually, she was wearing a top very much like this. It completely disappeared when I brought it into software that way. The, the, really, the answer is you can trust what this gives you. Trying to judge exposure by a histogram 
is going to be a real iffy game because it depends on how good you are at evaluating the histogram based on what you're seeing in front of you. There are some people that are very good at it. If you're photographing something that's very high key, something that's got a lot of white in it, and you look at the histogram and you know to push it off to the right and that's what it should look like, you, you can get close that way. Same thing with the dark scene. However, I've found that most folks are not really good at that. So having a meter and just trusting it takes that out of the equation. Also, the other thing about a histogram is, depending on how you frame the camera, just moving a little bit is going to change the elements in the scene, and that's going to change the histogram. So it's a re and you're going to try to adjust the exposure accordingly to get the histogram to stay in the same place. It's a very hit or miss thing, and it's going to introduce a lot of variability. Just learning to use a handheld meter is going to eliminate all of that guesswork, and it's going to eliminate having those clippings and just getting bad exposures and having to do lots of bracketing because then you're going to end up with a whole bunch of files that you don't want. And you're going to have to sort through them, and that's going to be a big waste of time. So what I'd recommend is if you don't have a meter, borrow one. Try it out. And once you start to use it, I'm sure you'll become a believer in it. Let's see. Um, anything else I want to adjust here? Oh, someone, uh, someone re-explained that backlit question. So I, want to, I do want to address this. Uh, what they meant by backlit is when the sun is behind the subject and the subject is in shadow. If you want the subject, for example, a person exposed correctly, how do you meter for that? If that's the case, let's say I've got a light coming from behind me and the primary purpose of this photograph is taking a picture of me, which means you've really run out of good subjects to take if you're stuck with this. But what I would do in that case is very simple. I've got the sun behind me. Um, in that case, I'm going to take the meter and I'm going to meter right at the subject. I want the light falling on them right back towards the camera like that. I'll take that number, put it in my camera. Do understand that to get this person who's backlit exposed correctly, you're very probably going to blow out the highlights in the background. That's where some, something called subjective metering comes into play. What is important in the scene? So if you do need this person exposed correctly, you're just going to meter in the same light that is hitting them, really right under their chin, back to the camera, and that will give you the perfect exposure for the face. Good question. We'll do that. We're gonna, we have some uh, environmental portraiture webinars coming up, and we're going to do a lot of that. Let's see. Someone asked, if you meter off a gray card uh, and use this image in camera as the white balance, does it do the same thing as an incident meter? Hmm. We had white balance and exposure there in the same question. I'm going to ask you to rephrase that if you can clarify and because we're going to do something else and then we'll come back. So and this goes to something I said earlier. You've captured all these great images. Now it's time to put the color in the best place it can be. Just like we've learned that different cameras see middle grade differently, they also have different opinions as to what the best color is. On top of that, Adobe provides an Adobe standard profile, a color profile for each camera that while fairly accurate, causes a loss or shift in some colors. And creating a custom camera profile will put that image color back into the best and most consistent place it can be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you in Lightroom real quick where this lives. Lightroom, by the way, is basically a giant Adobe Camera Raw. So everything that I do here is exactly the same in Adobe Camera Raw if you're a Photoshop person. Uh, and there are webinars that go into a lot of detail on this. But let's jump into Lightroom. I just want to show you a couple of things here. So here's my computer. Here's one of our shots of the passport. And as far as white balance goes, if you hadn't white balanced ahead of time, let's say you had some funky white balance on your camera and you ended up with something like this. You can white balance after the fact with a raw file very easily. I typically like to use one of these two lighter gray patches. Uh, white can get a little close to being clipped, so I like to come one or two in. So if I click on that, now I have a perfect white balance. Now, to create a profile, it's amazingly easy. You just take the image of your, your passport, and by the way, you don't have to white balance it first because the software is going to ignore that anyway. But you go to Export with Preset, Color Checker Passport. Give it a name. I'll just call it uh, Passport Landscape, if I could only type. And click on Save. Now, it'll take a minute to do that. So what's going on is the software is taking a look at the target. Uh, it finds where the target is. 
it's got a uh, tonal range thing in here with white to black patches and it's got the rest of these colors and if you ever notice we've got red green blue CMYK and then two rows rows of colors that simulate colors that you would run into out in nature skin tones plant tones it knows what the value of each of these patches is supposed to be a profile for a monitor for a printer and for a camera is basically a set of corrections against a set of known colors. So it knows what the value of this red should be. It's going to look to see what the camera software said that red should be and create a correction for that so that every time you take a shot in daylight, that red, that green, that blue are all going to fall right into place. Now the beauty of that is as you travel around during the day, your camera might be influenced. And what if you're shooting with two different cameras, as I often do, or you're shooting with someone else who has another camera, maybe a different model, maybe even a different brand. By creating a profile for each of those cameras, what's going to happen is they're all going to match. They're going to color response is all going to match because they then have the same standard. Yes, we're going to talk about the artistic license of color adjustments, but what this does is it puts everybody on a playing field that is completely accurate. So let's go back into the software a second. You can see here the software says the profile has been generated and Lightroom needs to be restarted. However, just like every good cooking show, I had one in the oven for you already, so we're going to go ahead and see that. Now, the profile is already in here. What I want to show you is where you apply it, and it's in the develop module. Uh, if you're a Photoshop person, again, it's in Adobe Camera Raw under the little camera icon in the upper right-hand corner. So I click on camera calibration and you see the Adobe standard here. Now what I want you to take a close look at are these colors here. Look at these blues, this orange, uh, kind of the, the, the purple, pink, and this yellow here. Watch what happens when I apply the profile, the custom profile created for the Alpha 99. When I click on that, did you see all the colors jump? All the blues got more intense and so did some of these yellows. Let me turn it off again so you can see. I go back to the standard and you can see these blues in particular and this orange have changed their intensity. And if you own a color checker passport, by the way, you could see that just with your own eye that this blue is a lot more intense than it was showing up in software. And yes, I'm dealing with a calibrated monitor. It puts everything back into place. So let's take a look and see. Let's apply that profile to one of the landscape images and watch what happens in this case to the sky on the first one. Let me bring uh, this one up. Actually, in this image, both the sky, whoops, let me zoom back out, both the sky here and the yellow flowers in the distance, in the foreground, are going to change color when we apply this profile. So watch what happens. Here's the Adobe Standard. I'll go back to our profile. And did you see that was a huge color shift? The blues got much more intense in the sky, and the, the yellows got more intense as well. Let me turn that off again. So there's where we started. And that's what our custom profile did. Of course, I want, sorry about that. Of course, I might want to make edits from that point on. But what this did was it got all the color back. Uh, it gave me a much more film-like response. I've got that intense blue. I've got the intense yellows back. I find that blue skies benefit the most. If it's a very cloudy, overcast day where the light is very flat, the profile isn't going to have as much of effect. However, I took one shot where I was actually surprised what it did. Let me show you one more. Go back into software here. And this was a, a sunset shot. The sun had already, actually the sun had already set. And I didn't think the profile was going to have that much of an effect on the image. But I was surprised, pleasantly so, what happened to the orange in the sky when I changed from the standard to the custom profile. In this case, the oranges got a little bit lighter and a little more intense. So again, here's the standard. You can see it's lost a little brightness, a little saturation. And it actually gave me that the intense orange back. Same thing even for this night scene. Sun's already set. We've got the moon up. Uh, this is Dante's view. Adobe standard. And the Alpha 99 profile put those blues right back to where they really needed to be. So the result of the whole meter passport combination, by having that exposure profile and the camera color profile, you're going to get the best starting point in terms of exposure and color. I'm going to cough, excuse me. 
<coughs> Sorry about that, tickle in my throat. Now, you can still make your edits knowing you have the best data possible. So going back to the original question, why do you still need to do edits? You've got a perfect exposure, you've got your color all set. Well, your eyes see differently than your camera does. Your eyes can see, I've read anywhere from 18 to 22 stops of tonal range. The best cameras are going to give you maybe eight, maybe nine stops. You can see much greater tonal range and you're going to need to rein that in if you have a contrasty scene. Secondly, color. Your eyes adjust color temperature automatically for you. So if you've got a scene that's partially in shade and partially in sun, your camera only gets to choose one color temperature. And that's going to make, say for example, if you have sun, uh, for example, let's say here, this, let me get over here, this shot here of Dante's view, I've got this setting sun where I've got a bright yellow here, but the valley was in deep shadow. So what ended up happening was this went very blue. So I needed to edit that. I needed to go into the software and change the color temperature of that foreground because your eyes do that for you. The camera can't. It can only pick one. The other part of it is artistic license. My friend Rick Salmon uh, preaches something in one of his many Salmonisms. If you're not familiar, go check out his, uh, his website. There's great stuff there. One of his Salmonisms is we don't take a picture, we make a picture. And the goal of a landscape photograph is to create an impression of what the scene had on you and what you want to convey to the people that are looking at the image. It's not just an editorial shot of, oh yeah, there was a tree there and there was a mountain there. You want to create a sense of the place and what it made you feel. And taking those colors, getting them all the way your mind's eye saw them, and creating an image that speaks to you is then going to do a better job of transmitting that story. In fact, to that end, uh, we're getting close to the end here. Let's take a look at some of my edited images from the Death Valley photo shoot, and then we'll be right back. So I think you can see we had a great time. Uh, Death Valley is a phenomenal spot for landscape. If you ever find yourself having to go to Las Vegas for a convention or something, uh, it's only two and a half, three hours from Las Vegas to Death Valley, and uh, just take advantage of it. Stay away from the place during the summer, though. It's nasty. We were there. Uh, the temperatures were extreme. You might have seen uh, I was really bundled up some mornings. It was just over 30 degrees. And then that afternoon, it hit 99. So uh, be prepared for extremes and dress in layers. A couple more questions before we get close to finishing up. Uh, someone asked about when I take a shot of the passport, 
Uh, do I do it in direct sunlight or in the shade? Good question. I personally create two daylight profiles, one sun and one shade. And for the shade, well, you saw, just like we did in the videos, I'll just find a bright shade place and I'll create a profile there. When I'm doing regular normal landscapes out in the sun, even if it's partly cloudy, but direct sun, I will literally just hold the passport out in front of me with the sun shining on it and take a picture of it. And that's what I'll use for my daylight profiles. And what that comes to, uh, somebody asked about one of the night shots. In fact, Jen, if you'd show my screen again, I'll, I'll talk about this because this is a really good point. The question is, for the night scene, did I use a meter one? And two, what profile did I use? That's a good point. When I'm shooting a scene that is like this or pre-dawn or right at sunrise or sunset or just post-sunset, as far as the profile goes, I actually will use my daylight middle-of-the-day middle profile because you've got either this extremely warm or cool color happening, and I don't want to create a profile in white balance to actually factor that out. So actually, in this case, I use my personally, I use my midday profile for both sunrise and sunset. Uh, question was also, did I use a meter for this? And the answer is yes. For this particular scene, I used the 758. Uh, because I wanted the one degree spot meter in this. And what I did was, um, actually I don't have the nighttime scene, but this is actually right before that. What I did was I metered at the very bright part uh, of the sunset. Uh, the brightest part that was getting very close to being pure white because the sun was almost shining. And from that, to, in order to put that on the right, I opened up three stops from what the uh, one degree spot meter told me. So that's, that's the kind of thing that I will do with that. Uh, you also saw some landscape images in there. Uh, someone mentioned, um, how do you do exposure for uh, panoramics? And what I will typically do is, when you look at a panoramic, you've got to pick some spot of it that is maybe the most important. It's typically, for me, it's going to be the middle of the frame. So I will meter for the middle of the frame. That will be my exposure. As I go left and right, I don't let the camera change. I'll meter for the middle and then I'll take my exposures left and right. If you've got something where the sun is showing in your scene, you're not going to get it into, into tonal range anyway. It's always going to blow out. So pick the important spot on your panoramic, meter for that to get a perfect reading for that, and then leave that exposure setting that you've figured out and use all of your frames for that. That's how I will generally work. So I hope, I hope you've got kind of sense that this stuff really can make your photography better. It's going to give you better exposures. You're not going to lose images. You're not going to have to go through all this bracketing. You're not going to be chimping. You're not going to try to figure out, is my histogram good? You're just going to have the best data possible, which is going to give you the best starting point for doing your landscape edits. Two pieces you really should have. If you own one, get the other one. If you don't have a passport, best $99 you'll ever spend. If you don't have a meter, it will save you so much time uh, that it will really pay for itself quickly. So as we end for today, when I first announced the Death Valley trip during an earlier broadcast, I made an offer, I threw an offer out there that you guys would be welcome to join us for the day if you were going to be in the area. Well, one of our viewers, Mr. Terrence O'Neill, joined us on some of our shoots and we had an interesting conversation on the experience of shooting. Uh, as we sign off, uh, I'm going to play that interview with Terrence uh, after we're done. Uh, and next time we do plan a location shoot, I'll try to give you enough notice so that maybe you can uh, join in. I also want to mention some of the other gear. I've got one back here. This is going to be coming up. This is brand new. You're seeing something semi-secret here. This is a new Tenba hiking backpack. Uh, this is what I used for all of my travels and proved to be amazing. It's actually got an aluminum frame with webbing that keeps the backpack off your back, kept you from getting too hot. I'm going to go into details on gear for hikers uh, who are also photographers that cover backpacks and uh, tripods and what you can do with that. Uh, also, I want to end, I want to leave you today with kind of a little uh, short video about the last kind of thoughts I had. Uh, I'll let you in on a little secret about Dante's view. Uh, if, you're, if you're a Star Wars fan, stay tuned. Uh, so I'm going to leave you with my closing thoughts. And then after that, uh, if you're interested in seeing it, will be interview with uh, Terrence O'Neill. So thanks for watching. It's always a pleasure. Hope to see you guys online again soon. Until next time, be well.
So this is my last shoot uh, during this trip to Death Valley. We're at Dante's View, and off in the distance is the valley there. We've got a really deep sunset, so I'm going to go ahead and use my meter again, and I'm going to shoot for that f11, and I'm at 100 ISO. So again, I'm just going to hold out the meter flat to get the directional light, and it tells me f10.3. I'm not using a polarizer now because we're kind of shooting into the haze. Uh, I may try one, but I don't think it's going to work. So between a tenth and a thirteenth of a second at f11. Uh, also, I have my color checker passport. I will take a shot of it. But I probably won't use it for doing a profile at this time of day. I'll generally use a profile that we created in the middle of the day. And I'll use the same target that we used for doing our ambient uh, incident reading shot when we created the pro exposure profile. But I do have it here as a reference. I'll typically take a shot of it. And lastly, by the way, for you Star Wars fans, of which I am one, yeah, I'm a Star Wars geek. Uh, one of the Rangers told me this. Uh, this was the spot where one of the scenes for the first Star Wars, Episode 4, was shot, where Ben Kenobi is with Luke, and he points down, and he says, Mos Eisley Spaceport. You'll never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be cautious. This is the spot. And what they did was they took Furnace Creek down there, and uh, they added some other buildings post uh, to get their, their uh, shot. So anyway... A little bit of Star Wars trivia for you. Sun's just about behind the mountains. That's actually what I'm waiting for because it's very contrasty with the sun shining. I'm going to wait for the sun just to peek behind the mountain over here uh, and try to get a little bit of afterglow that will even out the brightness between the sky and the valley. We'll see how it goes. But this is what's made it possible. I've got my exposure, my uh, light meter with the exposure calculation with the passport. And you can see, you can see me getting darker as the sun goes down. So. I'll have to re-meter down an eighth of a second, but let's do it, let's put it to work, and we'll get great results. So the light's about gone on this beautiful day. It's been a great couple of days in Death Valley. Had a lot of fun putting the meter to work, putting the color checker to work. And now it's actually time for me to put the camera away. I'm just gonna enjoy the beauty of the scene. It's a gift to be here. I enjoy every moment of it. Sometimes you just need to do that. Put the camera away. Enjoy the beauty of the place. Let it soak in. It'll improve your photography and improve your whole experience. So, thanks for watching. Hope to see you guys online again soon. All right, well, it's just us. Yeah, good morning. So, good morning. We're here with Terrence O'Neill, one of our uh, webinar viewers. Yes. And who uh, took us up on our, our uh, invite to join us in Death Valley. And we're just, uh, we went out and sh shot sunset this morning, and we're here to uh, get breakfast now. I don't know about you, I shot sunrise. You shot, I shot sunrise. You oh, did I say sunset? <laughs> yeah, I haven't had any coffee yet, so that explains that. Oh, that, that. explains that. Yes. Okay. So, Terrence, have I made a believer of you in uh, meters and color checkers yet? You have. All right. I didn't, I didn't prompt them to say that either. In fact, uh, we're filming video right now with the Sony Alpha 99, and I just came over and metered us uh, 50th of a second at 5.6 at 100 ISO, so uh, that's all we got to do. So a couple questions I wanted to ask you okay. uh, since we've been out here. And one of the things was about why why shoot the landscape? What did it mean to you? Well, in my whole career, 50 odd years of surveying, I've seen a lot of California and a lot of memorable spots. And uh, now I want to go out and recapture some of those memories. And uh, so that photography now is my new career. All right. So for you, it's just it's a capturing your memories and uh, revisiting places. That is true. All right. I see photography two ways, as images and photographs. Photographs is documentation, and images is where I get to play and have some fun. All right. Terrence loves to play and post. Uh, That's true. Yes, he, he loves to, uh, to mess around with his files. Did I see you walking around with your color checker or not? I don't think I saw you. Yes, you did. Did I? Okay. You'll see it in my pictures. Okay. He's got a color checker passport also. These were uh, some interesting lighting conditions we ran into the past couple days. We went from partly cloudy to completely clouded over. 
to this morning we shot sunrise with not a cloud in the sky uh, and also the reflections of all the uh, the different colors in the the cliffs that we were photographing. Yes. You know, what do you think they would do to your color if your camera sees that under auto white balance? Every time auto white balance will basically bounce all around. Yeah, know, the color it's... checker is the one thing that well, once I bought the color checker, I'm a faithful user ever because it pulls the colors back and the colors just snap out. So. All right. This isn't a paid announcement, although we will buy them breakfast. All right. <laughs> so that's that's all the payment that's going on here. But he, he brings up a good point because uh, this is not a good place to do auto white balance. Uh, there's many different colors in the cliffs. We've got this kind of mustard to brown to red to occasionally a pale green. And then we have the blue sky and gray sand as well. And your camera has no idea what white is, has no idea what neutral is. So using the color checker and at least as a starting point, setting something basic like daylight is, is a good way to go. And we are, of course, shooting what? Raw, right? Always, always. Yes. And, and this JPEG stuff, especially for landscapes, because we, we do really need to do that. Well, I have pictures which I took with my D100 back, what, 11 years ago that were in RAW. And now with the uh, current uh, software that we have, I've recovered a lot of those pictures. So I'm a big RAW fan. Yeah, that's, that's something really common to it. And if you have, by the way, if you have an older camera that you were sh shooting RAW with, if you have a color checker passport, you can go create a profile for it now and apply it to images you shot 10 years ago. I just learned something. Yes, that, uh, you, there's nothing stopping you from going back and applying those profiles. Just get the camera out, create a profile for it, and off you go. So that's... I'll there, pull there, it off the shelf. There's our tip for the day. So that's it for us today. Terrence, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure meeting you. Well, it's been a wonderful weekend, Joe. Great. So uh, meter, color checker passport, and that's it. We're good to go.